Robert Vinoy, Foundations of Biblical Prophecy, Lecture Number 16. Last week I gave you Roman numeral number 10. I hope you were able to look through that because what I intended by handing that out was to save time in going through that. Let me just run through this and then if you have questions, perhaps we can discuss it further. I'm not going to read through the entirety of that handout, but highlight a few things. A is, quote, Does biblical prophecy have apologetic value? Preliminary considerations, end quote. Historically, there are many people who feel there is apologetic value in predictive prophecy, and therefore it is an apologetic tool that can be used effectively to argue for the truthfulness of the Bible and the existence of God who has spoken through Scripture. Because you have to look at prophecies given centuries ago and see fulfillment in much later times, and that provides a good apologetic tool for arguing for the truthfulness of Scripture and God's existence. So my first statement there is, there's a good reason to answer that question affirmatively. Is there apologetic value? I think there is. But there are some evangelicals among us who would answer negatively. Now, when you get outside the evangelical world, there are a lot of critical scholars who say there is no value whatsoever. I use, for purposes of illustration, a Dutch scholar, G.C. Alders, an Old Testament professor at University of Amsterdam, where I did my work. The volume he wrote... You can see it under the second paragraph is called The False Prophet in Israel. He discusses in that book this issue of apologetic value. He notes some positive factors, such as the use of prophetic fulfillment in a positive way, and those positive factors are numbered 1 through 5 on page 1 of your outline. I won't review all of them. But you get over to page 2, Alders has some serious objections to appealing to the fulfillment of prophecies as a criterion for demonstrating the truth of Scripture. In his view, when you look at those objections, the objections show that the apologetic value for the argument is not as great as you might initially be inclined to think. Then what follows is a list of his objections. There are three of them. The first is a, quote, disputes on fulfillment, end quote. He quotes, for example, Abraham Cunin in his book, The Prophets and Prophecy in Israel, and it gives a list of unfulfilled prophecies. He says Cunin has turned the apologetic argument around and on the basis of non-fulfilled prophecies has argued against fulfilled prophecies. Secondly, quote, disputes on dating and subjective factors in assessing the connections between prophecy and its fulfillment, end quote. In other words, you get into disputes with Daniel and the second part of Isaiah. Is Daniel dated in the time that it claims to be, or is it that some anonymous person writing around 165 B.C. when Antiochus Epiphanes had already appeared on the scene? He quotes a man named Davidson who says that if the argument of fulfillment will really have evidential value, it must adhere to the following conditions. Quote, First, the known promulgation must be prior to the event. Secondly, there must be a clear and palpable fulfillment of it. Lastly, the nature of the event itself, if, when the prediction of it was given, it lay remote from human view, and was such as could not be foreseen by any supposable effort of reason or deduced upon principles of calculation derived from probability or experience, end quote. Now, in that statement, all of those italicized words are what Alders would call subjective judgments. Things like known promulgation, nature of the event, could not be foreseen by effort of reason could not be seen or produced by deduction, 
Then Elders says that with respect to those subjective value judgments, it's clear that people will differ in their conclusions, so that a real convincing truth can never be found. But then you see what he does. He turns that around and says that the reverse is also true, so that no convincing proof against the divine origin of prophecy can be made by her non-fulfillment as Cunin attempts. In other words, the whole business can fall because it is subjectively determined. So that's his second objection. The third one is, quote, symbolic language nullifies apologetic value, end quote. I might say from the outset that Alders is an amillennialist. He is inclined to take the kingdom prophecies of the Old Testament for Christ in a spiritual or figurative kind of sense and apply them to the church. So several lines down in that paragraph under symbolic and apologetic value, he says that this creates a particular difficulty for appealing to prophecy and fulfillment as the apologetic tool. Alders argues that the literal approach of men like Keith does not do justice to the symbolic nature of many prophecies. It is Elder's view that the prophecies often speak of Jerusalem, Zion, and the Temple in order to indicate spiritual realities of the New Covenant. Take the Isaiah 2 passage, quote, Everyone will come to the mountain of the Lord. It will be high and exalted, end quote. That's the coming of the church. Assyrian Babylon typifies sinful and destructive directions. He is not talking about a series of Babylons, but the enemies of God's kingdom in a spiritual sense. He adds that he cannot see how, notice this, quote, quote, one who adopts a more literal method of interpretation, such as Keith, can keep himself free from the Kiliast error, end quote. Do you know what the Kiliast error is? Kiliast is a thousand. It is premillennial eschatology, where you take these prophecies that speak of the future thousand-year reign of Christ here on earth, in which swords will be beat into plowshares. So you see what he is saying is, if you're doing interpretation, taking it literally, you're going to become a premillennialist. That's unthinkable for somebody like elders. He says that were the prophecies concerning Babylon to be fulfilled literally down to the details, one cannot propose a different manner of fulfillment for the prophecies with regard to Jerusalem and Israel. One should then also expect the detailed literal fulfillment of these prophecies. It is thus clear, according to elders, that appeal to the literal fulfillment of prophecies entangles apologetics in a great difficulty. But, and here's all the good points, if one abandons the literal method of interpretation in favor of a spiritual fulfillment, then one loses his weapon. Why? The spiritual fulfillment is difficult to explain to those who oppose the Christian faith. In other words, if you're going to use prophecy and fulfillment as an apologetic tool, and you're going to interpret it symbolically, it cuts the force of the apologetic argument. I remember reading this some years ago now, and something dawned on me, but I never put it down before. I think this is true. And that is, if you look out at evangelical interpreters, you will find that amillennialist interpreters are normally presuppositionalists in apologetics. Amillennialists tend to interpret more symbolically and figuratively, and they do not normally use prophecy and fulfillment as an evidence for the truthfulness of the Bible. Whereas premillennialists, who tend to interpret more literally, generally are not presuppositionalists in apologetics. They are usually evidentialists, and this is one of the evidences of the truthfulness of Scripture. So, you might not think there is any connection between apologetic systems and eschatological systems, but I think there is a pretty tight one when you really reflect on it. In general, those who are amillennialists are also going to be presuppositionalist apologetics. And those who are premillennialists in general are going to be evidentialists in apologetics. I am sure there are exceptions, but in general it certainly fits with elders and he makes a point of it.
Notice this next statement. Elders then concludes that it's not the fulfillment of prophecy that brings the conviction of the divine truth of Scripture, but the reverse. The conviction of divine truth of Scripture leads to belief in fulfillment of prophecy. And, of course, there again, the eschatological view is pretty tight with the apologetic view. He argues that the certainty of the revealed truth of God does not rest in any outward evidences, rather in itself. God does not force men to believe. It is also his will that fulfillment of prophecy should not stand outside of all doubt as something incontrovertible, but rather that it should render only such certainty that the believer can find in it support for his faith. In other words, someone who has come to faith and believes and then looks at prophecies can find support for his faith, but someone who has not come to faith may now look and find little or no value in them. He says that for the one who recognizes the Bible as the word of God, the fulfillment of prophecies is clear as day and therefore it can serve to confirm his faith. That's certainly legitimate. My favorite question is, does it also have some role for the unbeliever to bring him to the place of being open to listening to the Bible? So he says the fulfillment of prophecy is not without value in a secondary sense. But for one who does not believe in the scripture, it does not speak so clearly that he is forced to, to see the divine origin of Scripture. Elder says it therefore comes down to what he calls the internal principle, which is at the heart of his position. One believes Scripture to be God's Word, or one does not believe Scripture to be God's Word. This belief is the fruit of the working of the Holy Spirit. The final ground for the certainty of Christian truth is to be sought in the testimony of the Holy Spirit. So his conclusion is that apologetics is better off not to involve itself with seeking for objective evidence for the truth of Scripture, but rather it should retreat to this subjective standpoint and then demonstrate that the non-Christian worldview, in spite of the arguments to the contrary, also cannot justify itself with any ground of evidence and it has its own starting point in a subjective just as much as the Christian position. So that's the heart of what his view is on, quote, the apologetic value of the prophecy, end quote. In his view, you either believe the Bible and Scripture or you don't. And whether you believe or not that the Bible is the Word of God, it is the work of the Holy Spirit. It's subjective. But then you turn that around and you tell those who are not believers that their position is also subjective. Now I think that in that you encounter the difference between presuppositional and evidential approaches to apologetics, which is another huge subject. I have an argument there. J.G. Machen from the, quote, Christianity and Culture publication. Details are found in your bibliography. You notice the underlying statement at the bottom of the page from Machen. He says, quote, It would be a great mistake to assume that all men are equally well prepared to receive the gospel. It is true that a decisive issue, then, is the regenerative power of God. End quote. It is the work of the Holy Spirit that brings people to the knowledge of Christ. He says, quote, that can overcome all lack of preparation, and the absence of that makes even the best preparation useless. End quote. And here's the underlying statement quote, But as a matter of fact, God usually exerts that power in connection with certain prior conditions of the human mind, and it should be ours to create, so far as we can, with the help of God, those favorable conditions for the reception of the gospel. I do not mean that the removal of intellectual objections will make a man a Christian. No, conversion was never wrought simply by argument. A change of heart is also necessary, and that can be wrought only by the immediate exercise of the power of God. Quote. But notice the next statement. Quote, 
but because intellectual labor is insufficient, it does not follow, as it so often is assumed, that it is unnecessary. God may, it is true, overcome all intellectual obstacles by an immediate exercise of his regenerative power. Sometimes he does, but he does so very seldom. Usually he exerts his power in connection with certain conditions of the human mind. End quote. The mind looks at and assesses whatever claims are being made for the truthfulness of the Bible and the truthfulness of the gospel. Quote, Usually he does not bring into the kingdom entirely without preparation those whose minds and fancy are completely dominated by the ideas of which make the acceptance of the gospel logically impossible. End quote. Francis Schaeffer often would talk about people as pre-evangelists, and he means dealing with questions, trying to answer objections to listening to the scripture or to the message of the gospel. I think that's what Machen is talking about here. I listed next another essay by Machen that's in your citations, pages 32 through 33. He says some of the same things in that discussion. Let's look at a couple of these paragraphs. Machen says, quote, a man hears some true preacher of the gospel. The preacher speaks on the authority of a book which lies open there on the pulpit. As the words of that book are expounded, the man who listens finds the secrets of his heart are revealed. It is though a cloak had been pulled away. The man suddenly sees himself as God sees him. He suddenly comes to see that he is a sinner under the just wrath and curse of God. Then from the same strange book comes another part of sovereign authority. The preacher, as he expounds the book, seems to be an ambassador of the king, a messenger of the living God. The man who hears needs no further reflection, no further argument. The Holy Spirit has opened the doors of his heart. That book is the word of the living God, he says. God has found me out, and I have heard his voice. I am his forever, end quote. Then Machen comments, quote, Yes, it is this way sometimes, but not by elaborate argument that a man becomes convinced that the Bible is the word of God. End quote. But then you notice he repeats what he said in the other quotation. Quote, Yet that does not mean that argument is unnecessary. I may be convinced with my whole soul that the Bible is the word of God, but if my neighbor adduces considerations to show that it is really full of error, I cannot be indifferent to those considerations. I can indeed say to him, Your considerations are wrong, and because they are wrong, I can, with good conscience, hold on to my convictions. Or I can say to him, What you say is true enough in itself, but it is irrelevant to the question of whether the Bible is the word of God. But I do not see how in the world I can say to him, Your considerations may be contrary to my conviction that the Bible is the word of God, but I am not interested in them. Go on holding them if you want to do so, but do please agree with me also in holding that the Bible is the word of God. End quote. It is a very real situation. He says, quote, No, I cannot possibly say that. End quote. That last attitude is surely quite absurd. Two contradictory things cannot both be true. We cannot go on holding the Bible as the word of God and at the same time admit the truth of considerations that are contrary to that conviction of ours. I believe with all of my soul, in other words, in the necessity of Christian apologetics, the necessity of a reasoned defense of the Christian faith and, in particular, a reasoned defense of Christian conviction that the Bible is the Word of God, end quote. And then he says, he was at a student conference where methods of evangelism were being discussed. He said, someone got up and said, in the middle of the next paragraph, quote, you never win a man to Christ until you quit arguing with him, end quote. You've probably heard that before. He says, quote, well, you know, my friends, when he said that, I was not impressed one little bit. Of course a man 
never was won to Christ merely by argument. That is perfectly clear. There must be the mysterious work of the Spirit of God in the new birth. Without that, all those arguments are quite useless. But because arguments are insufficient, it does not follow that they are unnecessary. What the Holy Spirit does in the new birth is not to make a man a Christian regardless of the evidence, but on the contrary, to clear away the mists from his eyes and enable him to attend to the evidence. So I believe in the reasoned defense of the inspiration of the Bible. Sometimes it is immediately useful to bring a man to Christ, but its chief use is of a somewhat different kind. Its chief use is in enabling Christian people to answer legitimate questions, not by vigorous opponents of Christianity, but of people who are seeking the truth and are troubled by hostile voices that are heard on every hand. End quote. So there are those comments by Machen. My next comment on the handout is that it's the Holy Spirit's work to open the heart. It's our responsibility to present the evidence. It seems to me there is a place for reasoning and defense of the gospel. 1 Peter 3.15 says that it's our responsibility to give reasons for the faith that is within us. There are two other articles referenced in the next paragraph. First, A.J. Newhouse, quote, Why we can get along, end quote, in First Things. Go to page 33 of your citation. He's talking in this article about connections between faith and reason. And he says, quote, In thinking about connections between faith, reason, and discourse, St. Augustine is particularly helpful. It is possible to find snippets, especially from his devotional and homiletical writings, that could be used to show that Augustine, a fideus, someone who sacrifices reason for faith, end quote. You know, to me, it seems like that someone who holds elder's position when he says that it's all internal principle. We either believe or we don't believe. Evidence has nothing to do with it. That's fideism. It, quote, can be used to suggest that Augustine is a fideist, someone who sacrifices reason to faith. But that would be a grave misunderstanding, end quote. You often see that. He believed in order to know. Augustine addressed in great sophistication why it is that faith is reasonable and why it is that reason without faith is incomplete. There is, for instance, the very engaging essay, The Usefulness of Believing. The very title reflects Augustine's assumption that Christian and non-Christian are able to consider together what would be useful for understanding the truth. Augustine makes the case that belief is necessary for understanding. He explains in great detail to his unbelieving interlocutor the reasonable case for believing. It is clear that Augustine and his interlocutor, who shared a common a priori, that belief is necessary to understanding. In everyday life, in science, in friendship, and in matters religious, and why belief is necessary as itself rationally explicable. Understand my word in order to believe, says Augustine, but believe God's word in order to understand, end quote. As Ephraim Gilson writes, in Augustine, the very possibility of faith depends on reason, because only reason is capable of belief. And again, the Augustinian doctrine concerning relations between reason and faith comprises three steps, preparation for faith by reason, act of faith, understanding the content of faith. But Augustine himself said it best, no one believes anything unless he first thought it to be believable. Everything which is believed should be believed after thought has proceeded. Not everyone who thinks believes, since many think in order to not believe, but everyone who believes thinks. Augustine was a firm opponent of what would later be called fideism, the claim that faith is utterly arbitrary that it is not supported by and cannot appeal to an a priori about what is reasonable, finds no support in 
Augustine, or for that matter in mainstream of the great tradition of the Christian thought. End quote. So there's that little second paragraph out of Newhouse's article. And then the next article mentioned on your outline is a fairly lengthy article by Donald Fuller and Richard Gardner, titled, quote, Reformed Theology at Princeton and Amsterdam in the Late 19th Century, a Reappraisal, end quote. It was published at Covenant Theological Seminary in 1995. I think that it is extremely helpful to explain the situation of the schools of thoughts generated at places like Princeton in the early 1900s. There was a period when the school of thought generated at Amsterdam University was presuppositionalist apologetics, and the Princeton school of thought was evidentialist as far as apologetics was concerned. It's a rather lengthy article. You'll notice I have a fair amount excerpted from it, starting on page 34 in your citations, going over to page 37. I don't want to take the time to go through that, but I encourage you to read it. I think you'll find it gets rather complex, but I think you'll find it helpful in sorting out these issues. Just turn to page 37, and we'll look at the last two paragraphs where Fuller and Gardner say, quote, Warfield and the old Princeton theologians believe that reason and faith cooperated in order to provide a knowledge of God coordinate with a true human knowing. Even if knowledge was incomplete, this coordinate notion of faith and reason is rooted in Augustinianism, end quote. As Newhouse was saying, quote, is deeply at odds with 19th century positivism, end quote enlightenment kind of thinking, and, quote, means that speaking about God to the unregenerate really matters. Warfield's vision for Christian engagement with secular intellectual perspectives is, therefore, quite different than the retreatist orientation of Kuiper, end quote. It was a retreat to that subjective position, the internal principle. Quote, Warfield writes, let us then cultivate an attitude of courage over against the investigations of the day. None should be more zealous of them than we. None should be more quick to discern truth in every field, more hospitable to receive it, more loyal to follow it wherever it leads. It is not for Christians to be lukewarm in regard to the investigations and discoveries of the time. But it is for us, therefore, as Christians, to push investigations at the utmost, to be leaders in every science, to stand in the vein of criticism, to be the first to catch in every field the truth of faith in our Redeemer. The curse of the Church has been her apathy to truth. She has nothing to fear from truth, but she has everything to fear, and she has already suffered nearly everything from ignorance. All truth belongs to us as followers of Christ, the truth. Let us at length enter into our own inheritance. End quote. So, those are some comments on this larger question. Quote, Is there apologetic value to prophecy fulfillment? End quote. Those are some of the positions that have been taken. B on page 5 is the heading quote, The Revelatory Claim of the Bible. End quote. The Bible presents itself as the Word of God not simply as a product of human thought or reflection. Much of the Bible concerns itself with human history, and in its prophetic sections the Bible claims to sketch broad lines of future history that are determined by the sovereign will of God who speaks through it. This unique claim calls for, and is certainly open to, verification and testing. Whether one believes the Bible or not, its historical statements, both predictive and non-predictive, are sometimes that to a great extent can be submitted for verification. The Bible indicates that much of its revealed plan for history has already been realized in the history of Israel and in the appearance of Jesus Christ. It is our contention that in the connection between prophecy and fulfillment, particularly in that between the Old Testament and in Christ, there is to be found an objective prophecy-slash-fulfillment structure that is clearly visible or recognizable. The existence of this 
prophecy slash fulfillment structure points to the existence and veracity of the God who has spoken in biblical revelation. This prophecy slash fulfillment structure is not characterized by what might be termed a religious or pietistical quality. It's not something subjective or internal. Rather, it is something that breaks through religious subjectivism by its very nature, because it stands as a recognizable entity that points to the reality and veracity of the God of biblical revelation, apart from the necessity of religious commitment to that God. In other words, you can look at a prophecy and look at history to see if it was fulfilled, and that's something that can be submitted to verification. That's something outside of oneself. In the Old Testament and New Testaments, we notice the demonstration of the existence of God is based primarily on clearly recognizable signs and coherence of prophecy and fulfillment. In other words, if you took the Bible itself, how does God make himself known? Think of the Exodus events and go through the plagues where the statement is explicit. Quote, These things are done so that you may know that I am Yahweh. End quote. You can see them. You can see that Moses speaks in advance, and it happens. That's also true in Joshua, where the same thing happens with crossing the Jordan River and the taking of Jericho. So demonstrating the existence of God is based primarily on recognizable signs and the coherence of prophecy and fulfillment. While this is true that intellectual recognition of the, quote, existence, end quote, of God is not belief in an existential sense, only because belief is possible by the work of the Holy Spirit, developing a relationship between man and God. It is, nevertheless, a corollary to and prerequisite for genuine faith. Genuine faith is a response to what God has demonstrated in history, in his power and his existence. In all this, it is necessary to remember that there is an objective revelation that is there. This objective revelation exists apart from the response of faith that is worked in the individual given by the Holy Spirit when that individual submits himself to the God of the biblical revelation. This distinction might be termed as an internal revelation and an external revelation. In order to avoid misunderstanding, we must make it clear that objective prophecy exists and is recognized by an identifiable character, the external revelation. Seems to me that's what people like elders miss. They talk about that internal principle. Well, fine. Yes, there is that internal principle, but that's the Holy Spirit regenerating inside us and opening the mind. No one is ever going to come to the knowledge of truth without it. But that doesn't mean there isn't an external principle or external revelation, something that's actually out there that evidences that God is who he claims to be. That's the way God made himself known through Scripture, signs and wonders and prophecy slash fulfillment. So that brings us to C. Quote, prophecy and fulfillment, end quote. In the Old Testament, we are confronted with a unique and surprising form of divine revelation. This revelation entails components that are adequate to demonstrate in an objective and recognizable way the reality of the God of Israel. They include, 1. God makes his existence and power recognizable among many witnesses in many ways, including signs, wonders, and theophanies. That is something that's out there. It can and has been seen by multiple witnesses. Number two, God makes known a plan for future history through his spokesman, the prophets. Number three, this plan for future history is brought into fruition as it has been professed and predicted by the prophets. Note that in the first component, signs, wonders, and theophanies, is the sense-perceptible presentation of something of which Yahweh claims to reveal himself. 
is the sense-perceptible presentation of something in which Yahweh claims to reveal himself. The second components are intended to confirm the evidence of that claim, that is, prophecy and fulfillment, plan and execution. Here it can be said that the Old Testament distinguishes itself from all other, quote, religious revelations, end quote, by not promoting belief simply on the basis of what certain persons claim to have received by divine revelation. Anybody can go out there and say, God's spoken to me. That's what Muhammad did. Anybody can do that. But it's not promoting belief on the basis of what people claimed they received by divine revelation. Rather, belief is founded in revelation that is connected with external signs and the progression of the history according to a previously announced plan. On the outline, I gave some biblical examples of that. Now, I want to make a distinction here. Those signs and wonders perform the function of authentication of the existence and power of God to the people who observe them in that time. We are no longer there. All we can do is read the reports of what God did at that time and how he revealed himself to his people at the time of the Exodus to the time of the conquest or the first advent of Christ. In the next paragraph there, I mention the Old Testament gives no mythological or metaphysical arguments for the existence of God. That's not the way God demonstrates his existence. Then the next paragraph. The signs that God gave to authenticate the words of the prophet and make his own presence visible to his people served an immediate and direct authenticating purpose in connection with the historical progress of revelation and redemption. With the completion of revelation, we should not look for the continuation of such signs. We talked about that before in connection with Voss's conception of the progress of revelation and redemption. Revelation has that objective side as well as the subjective individual side. Revelation is really the interpretation of redemption, and revelation moves along with it. But when the redemption reaches its climax in Christ, then revelation ceases to exist. But that's another issue. We don't look for a continuation of such signs. Signs, therefore, do not play the same direct authenticating purpose for us as they did for those to whom the signs were originally given. The connection between prophecy and fulfillment, however, is of such a character that its value as the evidence of the existence and veracity of God of biblical revelation continues to function in a direct way, even amongst succeeding generations. In other words, signs and wonders function in the time at which they were given. Now we read reports of it. Prophecy and fulfillment continue to function even for succeeding generations, because these generations can look at that prophecy slash fulfillment structure. If you can establish that the prophecy was given at a certain point in time, and it was not fulfilled until centuries later, there are many examples of these kinds of prophecies. There you have something that I think has apologetic value. J. A. Bloom and H. G. Gog and R. C. Newman, who was a New Testament professor here for many years, argued that fulfilled prophecy is an accessible kind of miracle, a testable miracle rather than a reported miracle. You see the distinction there. They argue that since fulfilled prophecy is an accessible kind of miracle, a testable miracle rather than a reported miracle, this character of prophecy serves to bypass the difficulty of the reported miracle, such as the observation and interpretation of what happened. Prophecy is different than a private experience of the miracle, because its fulfillment is often testable by any interested person, whether that person is sympathetic to the Bible's theistic worldview or not. Israel's God is, then, one who claims belief on the basis of things that the people have seen and experienced of him. Logically or rationally speaking, it can be said that the Old Testament demonstrates Israel could hardly do anything 
other than believe because she could know from objective facts that Yahweh is. How could you not come to that conclusion if you were among those who were sent out of Egypt, and that none of his words returned to him empty or void? Israel could and did willfully turn their back on things that were clearly idolatry. The Lord gave his people many infallible, the NIV has, quote, convincing, end quote, proofs, to use the wording of Acts 1, where he claims the veracity of his existence and power. In our witnessing, we should do nothing less and simply adopt the ways that God himself employed to demonstrate to his people that he exists. That's how he brought about the redemption of his people. So it seems to me, in that context, given certain qualifications that are mentioned in the conclusion, that prophecy and fulfillment is something that is verifiable and testable, and it is an objective structure that stands outside the individual. It does have a legitimate function in an apologetic sense of pointing to the truth claims of the Bible and of Christ as the Redeemer of mankind. I won't read through the conclusion, but you can do that on your own. So that's Roman numeral number 10. Page 6 of your class outline, we come to a new section of the course. Quote, survey of the prophetical books, end quote. As I have told you before, I want to go through the minor prophets of Hosea, Obadiah, Joel, and Amos for the remainder of our course. Point one is, quote, introductory remarks, end quote. So before going to Obadiah, let me just make some general comments. We talked earlier about classification of prophetic books. In the Jewish tradition, there is that of the former prophets and the latter prophets. The former prophets being what we normally today in our tradition are the historical books, Joshua, Judges, Samuels, and Kings. The latter prophets are what we call the prophetic books. They are divided into two groups. You're familiar with that classification, I'm sure. The major prophets and the minor prophets. The terms major and minor have nothing to do with significance or importance, but simply with length. The major prophets are the larger ones, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. The minor prophets are the twelve. I think you should know the names of them. I won't go through the list. But I do want to say something about the arrangement of the list of the minor prophets. You have been reading in Bullock, actually, you have been reading in a different order than Bullock has put them in, and the reason for that is simply that Bullock's dating of some of the prophets was different from the way I would date them. For example, the first one is Obadiah. But you get to that question of why are the minor prophets in our Bibles today in the order which they presently appear. When you look in our English Bible, and that's true in the Hebrew Bible as well, at the minor prophets you have Hosea, Joel, Amos, and Obadiah as the first four, and then Jonah and Micah. But if you go to the Septuagint, the first six are in this order, Hosea, Amos, Micah, Joel, Obadiah, and Jonah. It's quite a different order. The order we are familiar with is taken from the Hebrew Bible, and the Septuagint has a different order. If you look at the two lists, there appears to be little discernible criteria for either lists as far as the order in which the books occur. I think what is noticeable is that Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi are last, and they are all post-exilic. So it seems like there's a chronological element, at least in those last books. Amos is placed after Hosea in order. Hosea, Amos, Obadiah. Yet Amos was earlier than Hosea. So you have that question. And I don't think anyone has ever come up with a convincing explanation for the order of the books in either the Septuagint or the Hebrew Bible. But I think we should be aware of that. We are going to discuss dating issues with Obadiah and Joel. They are both very difficult to date. But I think you can divide the prophets into three periods if you use the nations that 
that were the prominent power that affected the history of Israel and Judah. The Assyrian period, the Neo-Babylonian period, and the Persian period. This is the order that you have been following in your reading in Bullock. So the Assyrian period has nine prophets. The Babylonian period, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Zephaniah, and Habakkuk. And the Persian period, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. So just those general comments looking at the first four of those books, Hosea, Joel, Amos, and Obadiah. Let's go to Obadiah. I gave you that handout. You'll notice that A, under Roman numeral 2, is, quote, Obadiah's date and author, end quote. I think that we had mentioned that Obadiah is one of the most difficult to date. Differences on date are not based on liberal or conservative viewpoints, and they range from about 840 B.C., which makes it the earliest, to shortly around the destruction of Jerusalem around 586 B.C., and then some as late as 450. So you can see that there is a wide range of conclusions. At the crux of the dating question lies the identification of the plundering of Jerusalem that's mentioned in verses 10 and 11. If you turn to Obadiah, which is a one-chapter book, you will notice it is an oracle against the Edomites. Judgment is being pronounced upon the Edomites. In verses 10 and 11, Obadiah says, quote, Because of the violence against your brother Jacob, end quote. Edomites are descendants of Esau. Quote, you will be covered with shame. You will be destroyed forever on the day that you stood aloof while strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem. You were like one of them. End quote. So there is a reference here to the Edomites having some sort of association with the plundering of Jerusalem. Strangers carried off wealth, cast lots for Jerusalem. You notice I say there that the crux is on the plundering of Jerusalem by the Edomites in 10 and 11 and possibly go on to 14. That becomes an interpretive issue and it does have a bearing on the date. Do verses 12 through 14 speak of some future similar kind of plundering of Jerusalem or are they a continuation of verses 10 and 11? I will come back to that and we will discuss it in more detail later. But first, what are the positions that have been argued for the identification of the plundering of Jerusalem mentioned in verses 10 and 11? I have three of them listed here. A is, quote, a plundering in the reign of Jehoram of Judah by a coalition of Philistines and Arabians, end quote. In 2 Chronicles 21.8, you read that in the time of Jehoram, Quote, Edom rebelled against Judah, set up his own king. End quote. Verse 10. Quote, to this day, Edom has been in rebellion against Judah. End quote. Go down to verse 16. It is the same time during the reign of Jehoram. Quote, the Lord aroused against Jehoram the hostility of the Philistines and the Arabs who lived near the Cushites. They attacked Judah, invaded it, and carried off all the goods they found in the king's palace, along with the sons and wives. Not a son was left, end quote. So there are our records on the pillaging of Jerusalem connected to the rebellion of the Edomites. In 2 Kings 8.20, you have no reference to the rebellion of the Edomites against Jehoram. So it's possible that the Edomites cooperated in that invasion, and shared in the spoils. That may be what provoked the judgment on Edom in Obadiah. That's the early view. The second view is that in verses 10 and 11 of Obadiah, what you have is a reference to the Babylonian plundering of Jerusalem in 586 BC. Destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, some say, is supported by Ezekiel chapter 35 verse 5, but the reference is not conclusive. Ezekiel 35 5 says, quote, This is a prophecy directed to Edom, a prophecy of judgment. Quote, because you harbored 
and ancient hostility and delivered the Israelites over at the time of the sword, at the time of their calamity, the time of their punishment reached its climax. End quote. Clearly, the time of the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem is in view. Quote, Therefore, as surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, I will give you the bloodshed. I will pursue you, since you did not hate bloodshed. Bloodshed will pursue you. End quote. So I think it's clear that, yes, the Edomites did have some participation in the plundering of Jerusalem in 586, but that doesn't mean that they hadn't done it earlier because Edom later took a similar position at the time of the destruction of Jerusalem, is not to say that they had not done something similar at an earlier time. Objections to the 586 date are that there's no mention of deportation of the whole population. There's no mention of the destruction of the city and the temple. Neither is there any mention of Nebuchadnezzar from verse 10. Quote, Because violence against your brother you will be covered with iniquity, end quote. Then, on top of page 2, the interpretation of 10 and 11, and 12 through 14, as having two points of reference, must be considered. There is similar phraseology in Jeremiah chapter 49, verse 1, and its relation to Obadiah 1 through 6. Some try and use that for dating. There are allusions in the language between Jeremiah 49, 1 through 7, and Obadiah 1 through 6. The question is, which prophet has priority? Things are divided on which is the original, or whether both reflect an earlier source of some unknown prophecy. How do you explain these similarities in language? Is Obadiah reflecting the language of Jeremiah, or is it the other way around? Is Jeremiah reflecting the language of Obadiah? It could be either. So I don't think that that's a way of coming to a conclusion about dating. But then, a third suggestion comes from J. Barton Payne, is that verses 10 and 11 of Obadiah talk about an attack on Israel by Syria going at the time of Ahaz, and that was accompanied by the simultaneous attack by the Edomites. That's Second Chronicles 28, verses 16 through 18, where you read, quote, At that time, King Ahaz went to the king of Assyria for help. The Edomites had again come and attacked Judah and carried away prisoners, while the Philistines attacked down in the foothills, and then they give to Judah. They captured and occupied its places, end quote. So that's another possibility, although there is no specific reference to Jerusalem. Now, what follows are just some names. There are some advocates of the date after 586, after the plundering of Jerusalem by the Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar. R.K. Harrison believes a later date, about 450 B.C. So that's the question about dating. And as I mentioned, this question arises further when you get into looking more closely at verses 10 and 11 and 12 through 14. And what you conclude is the relationship between them. I want to hold off on that discussion for a few minutes yet, but we will come back to this. But which plundering of Jerusalem you see referenced in 10 through 11, it is going to affect your conclusion on dating. The author is Obadiah, which means, quote, servant of the Lord, end quote. He is a prophet about whom we know nothing. All we have is his prophecy, and there's not much in the book of Obadiah itself that says anything about this individual. There are several other Obadiahs mentioned in the Old Testament, but no others mentioned that connect to the time of Ahab. B is, quote, the theme of the book, end quote. We've already related that a little bit here. It's a pronouncement of judgment on Edom. I have already mentioned Edomites were descendants of Esau. Go back into Genesis and see the relationship of the Edomites to Esau. Genesis 36 verse 8 tells us that Esau lived in the Seir mountain range of Edom, often used as a synonym for the homeland directly south of the Dead Sea, 
and to the east with a mountainous country east of the Rift Valley Depression, connecting the Dead Sea and the Gulf of Aqaba of the Red Sea. The principal cities were Bozra and perhaps Sela, which means, quote, private rock, end quote. Some think that this is a reference to the city of Petra, which is a famous archaeological site in the Edomite territory. From Ezion Geber, which is at the very tip of the Gulf of Aqaba, is a road called the King's Highway, which ran north through Edom. That was the route Moses wanted to lead the Israelites on at the time of the Exodus, but if you remember, at that time the Edomites refused to let Israel go, and therefore they had to go around. From that point forth, there were conflicts between the Edomites and the Israelites. I think this is the outworking of what you might call the Jacob and Esau controversy. If you remember that whole situation when there was a struggle with the two brothers for the blessing from Isaac and so on. Look at page 38 of your citations. Kyle made some comments on this relationship, and we will conclude with this. He said, quote, Wrong or violence is all the more reprehensible when it is committed against a brother. The fraternal relations in which Edom stood towards Judah is still more sharply defined by the name Jacob, since Esau and Jacob were twin brothers. The consciousness that the Israelites were their brethren ought to have impelled the Edomites to render helpful support to the oppressed Judeans. Instead of this, they not only reveled with scorn and malignant pleasure in the misfortune of the brother nation, but endeavored to increase it still further by rendering active support to the enemy. This hostile behavior of Edom arose from the envy at the election of Israel, like the hatred of Esau for Jacob, which was transmitted to his descendants and came out openly around the time of Moses in the unbrotherly refusal to let the Israelites pass in a peaceful manner through the land. On the other hand, the Israelites are always commanded in the law to preserve a friendly and brotherly attitude toward Edom, end quote. In Deuteronomy 2, verses 4 and 5, and 23, 7, it is enjoined upon them not to abhor the Edomites, because he is their brother. So you have the outworking, you might say, of that Jacob-slash-Esau controversy that is still going on at whatever date this is, 840, 586, and so on. All right, we will stop here and pick up with C, which is, quote, some comments on the content, end quote, next time. This ends Dr. Robert Vinoy's Foundation of Biblical Prophecy, lecture number 16. Mm -hmm.